A child may ask, what is the world's story about? And a grown man or woman may wonder, what way will the world go? How does it end? And while we're at it, what's the story about? I believe that there is one story in the world, and only one, that has frightened and inspired us so that we live in a pearly white serial of continuing thought and wonder. Humans are caught in their lives, in their thoughts, in their hungers and ambitions, in their avarice and cruelty, and in their kindness and generosity too, in a net of good and evil. I think this is the only story we have, and that it occurs at all levels of feeling and intelligence. Virtue and vice were warp and woof of our first consciousness, and they will be the fabric of our last. And this, despite any changes we may impose on field and river and mountain, on economy and manners. There is no other story. A man, after he has brushed off the dust and chips of his life, will have left only the hard, clean questions. Was it good or was it evil? Have I done well or ill? Hey, boss listeners. It also sounds weird to start it that way because that's not natural. Hey, boss listeners, this is Nathan. You know? It's like it starts kind of forced. I think it's fine. Okay. Hey, boss listeners, this is Nathan. I think the point is to say that as if you've said it many times before. What does that sound like? It's like, well, you say it, that's like your conventional greeting. Right. Can you say it for me? Hey, boss listeners, it's Nathan. Ah, there it is. There is the actor here. <laughs> say it again. Hey, boss listeners, it's Nathan. Hey, boss listeners, it's Nathan. Today I'm chatting with David and Nick about John Steinbeck's self-proclaimed masterpiece, his 1952 novel, East of Eden. It's kind of difficult to summarize the book, because there's kind of three things that John Steinbeck does. First, he explores this idea that there's only one story to tell, and it's a story that we've been living out generation to generation, and it's a story of good and evil. Second, it takes place in the place in California where John Steinbeck grew up, in Salinas, in California's Central Valley. And third, it's a sort of family soap opera that plays out over two generations in the Hamilton family and the Trask family. But there's a host of characters, from the purely wicked Kathy Ames to Adam's wise Cantonese cook, Lee. So I think because of the broad, sprawling nature of this book, we struggle a little bit to sink our teeth into it. But some of the questions that we ask are, are the characters compelling? Does Steinbeck kind of rely on one-dimensional stereotypes? Do his philosophical musings hold up today? And does it make more sense to read this book as historical fiction or maybe as fantasy, something more akin to J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings? So thanks for tuning in, because we know you didn't have to. Thou mayest tune in, and we appreciate that. like to start talking about that quote and the, pur- <laughs> the, pur- the purpose of of those chapter introductions that he does uh please do part of me kind of enjoys them actually <laughs> <laughs> because they feel so classic you know it's very it feels classic. like so old school literature just like here's me explaining what this book is about to you in case you couldn't <laughs> put two and two together and so They give a sort of nice foundation, but they also limit the way you read the story, Mm -hmm. right? It's Mm. like, here's what's happening, so now read this moral into this narrative. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a crutch for Steinbeck and maybe for the reader. It kind of forces you down a certain path. Is it so different than, uh, say, Kundera or Camus, who kind of didn't maybe block it out as clearly as Steinbeck does, where it's like, this short chapter, I'm just going to tell you the moral of the story yeah. or the philosophy, yeah. and then we'll get back into the story. It's like, hey, wait a second. I'm going to step outside of the story for a second. But Camus and Kundera kind of do a similar thing. They weave their philosophy into it, but it's also not, it's not just a story. There's... Mm the sort of, you know, 
voice in your head telling you what it means. I think it is different enough because when I started reading this, it was almost like a drug. I was like, oh, this is so, this is such a pure story. I'm like just loving that there is this character who's saying this very direct thing and represents this one thing. And I love that Steinbeck is telling me exactly the philosophy and this is what the moral is. But then like, as he kept doing it, I was like, oh, there's like nothing to interpret here. There's only like one meaning to this book. And you're just telling us directly, kind of repeatedly. So yeah, I think I, I never got that vibe with like, I felt like Kundera honestly is the best of, of all of those with that. Like, here's how I'm going to weave in my philosophy into it. And Steinbeck to me, I don't want to say it's the same as Camus, kind of like broad stroke in it right now, but like, he's definitely very direct here and more direct than some of his earlier works, in my opinion. This just seems like like a like a pop concept novel. Yeah, well, I was gonna I was gonna mention that this mo- novel was immensely popular, and it's still immensely mm-hmm. popular. It's one mm-hmm. of the best selling novels. I mean, I don't know where it ranks, but it must be one of the best selling novels of the 20th century. And I I wonder about him writing this very popular novel as a sort of vehicle for his philosophy, which I think he's very clear about. And it seems to be very, uh, you know, relevant to the 1950s. I mean, maybe we can get into a little bit about what he is actually saying here um, or yeah. what each of us, you know, what stood out to each of us about some of the the points that he was making as John Steinbeck, literally, right? Because he's actually, he wrote himself into yeah. the story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like Steinbeck is the narrator, right? And so when we have these expositions at the beginning of sections, we can just assume we can understand that that's John Steinbeck because he talks about himself and the Steinbeck family. No, it'd be, he's, he's related to the, the Hamiltons, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's Olive Hamilton's son. Yeah. Wait, so maybe I should just ask that as a question. Is the narrator John Steinbeck? I mean, I think so. If he's somebody else, I didn't get it. I mean, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> at, and at first you don't realize it, that it's, the character of the narrator is him. Mm-hmm. At least I didn't. Until much later when someone goes to visit his home and they call him the Steinbecks. I was like, oh shit, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe that happened maybe that happened earlier. I, I just f- totally forgot about it. But at first the narrator bothered me because like how does this child know all of this? Yeah, that old assumption. That old that whole thing was ridiculous. But he tried to kind of explain it away. He was like, we had to make some assumptions based on pieces of information. Yeah, yeah. And then there's certain characters because he made so many. He's like, and uh, this one, I never actually heard much about. She died or something. (laughs) (laughs) But Yeah. So, you know, let your imagination sort of leap that hurdle and just accept that the narrator knows these things. That's fine. I was thinking, like, why build this character to narrate this book? The reason to do that it seems, is to maybe create some distance between the author and the narrator. Then he goes ahead and names the narrator himself. (laughs) So I feel like we started shitting on the book immediately. It's not to say I didn't enjoy reading it and that I think it's actually a pretty good book Mm -hmm. for the most part. Like, I still liked it, and I think the message is still apt and kind of important to at least think about and... it's it's funny. Okay, okay, so maybe I should preface everything I say for this podcast with I partly listened to it on Audible and I partly read it and I went back and forth. And I'm pretty sure I didn't accidentally skip anything. <laughs> but um, I will say that the book reads really well as an audiobook. And, and so when you're talking about the narrator being inconsistent, like I didn't notice that at all. And it... Sorry, not inconsistent, just logistically impossible. Maybe the uh, there's works of, of fiction or art that kind of like break their own rules and they do it in such a way that if you're looking for the rules, then it's hard to like it. But if you just accept the flow of it, then you can just accept that, hey, you know, the rules only exist for a reason. And, you know, this person, Steinbeck, has been writing so long that maybe he can go ahead and break all the rules about, you know, why the narrator why develop a narrator or whatever if it keeps you engaged through the whole 600 pages and 
to write a 600-page book that's still popular 70 years later. He must have done something right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's popular because, you know, we talk about breaking rules, and I actually think that this almost follows way too many rules. Because it's just, like, the characters are all pretty much one-dimensional. That's sort of world-building in a way, right? This thing... There's not a lot of nuance anywhere. It's this story of good versus evil, as you know, the intro quote kind of uh, put out there. And there's a pureness to that that I liked, but I also realized that I would kind of enjoy that, almost the mystery of it. You know, it's at certain points, this novel didn't read that differently from like a DeShiel Hammett or, you know, some of like the pulp fiction type of stuff. Especially in like the second half when like, uh, you know, they're getting into the stuff with uh, the the cops and detectives and trying to find Ethel and things like this. There was just Mm -hmm. all of this kind of very classic like 1950s hard boiledness to it. And I liked reading that, but I felt when I was done reading it that I wasn't ever thinking about it, which is almost inverted to the books that I realized that when we always talk about it. Sometimes I didn't really like a thing, but I realized it made me keep churning on it to really process it and figure out what's going on. And then later I would end up like developing a greater appreciation for it. This to me, I feel like is very face value. And I kind of loved it at points, really did. Especially like, you know, I don't want to rag on Steinbeck, like his philosophical insights are kind of great. They're just really to the point, but they don't really leave anything else for me to think about. I think that's like where I've arrived. Well, let's, what are some of these points? I feel like we've been talking around the clear points that he's making, but what are some of these clear points that he's making? I'll read one. And I think other than the good versus evil story, like there's only one story left in the world, or there was only ever one story to tell. I think this is really the core of what the book is about. So he says, I don't know how it will be in the years to come. There are monstrous changes taking place in the world, forces shaping a future whose face we do not know. Some of these forces seem evil to us, perhaps not in themselves, but because their tendency is to eliminate other things we hold good. It is true that two men can lift a bigger stone than one man. A group can build automobiles bigger and better than one man. And bread from a huge factory is cheaper and more uniform. When our food and clothing and housing all are born in the complication of mass production, mass method is bound to get into our thinking and to eliminate all other thinking. In our time, mass or collective production has entered our economics, our politics, and even our religion, so that some nations have substituted the idea collective for the idea God. This in my time is the danger. There is great tension in the world, tension toward a breaking point, and men are unhappy and confused. And so if you think of like the post-war setting of writing this, 50s, all that kind of optimism that comes with it, I think it's Steinbeck basically working out his philosophy of the individual versus the collective. You put that across the backdrop of communism and basically where that sits in post-war American culture. It's kind of this question of, are you responsible for yourself? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the whole arc of the novel is the answer is yes. Yeah. And I find some resonance in that today. I think it's, maybe not as pure of a point as he's making. I think things are a little bit murkier than that. But I do appreciate what he says. I think his philosophical insights are a little bit simplified. But I think that's what the whole book is about, is you're responsible. Yeah. I mean, this is the whole debate around when Lee and his Chinese grandfather's you know, the, the old men sit around and spend years dissecting that Hebrew translation of, <laughs> of Tim Shell. Right. That's such a huge part of the book. It's all about you may or you may not. The choice is yours. And there's mm-hmm. key points throughout the novel when, when Samuel, who is, you know, probably the one, one of the most likable characters outside of Lee in this book, when he near the end decides to tell Adam about his wife, it's just after they discussed this and it was that it's like this springboard into all these other actions because he he made the choice to do it. He he chose. Uh, yeah, choice is a big thing. I think, and it is, 
I, I think it's not just about, I mean, it is about collective, but it's really about individual responsibility and choice. It's a big thing. And it's about how this fear of, of not having that choice is a big thing, whether it's, whether it's from collectivization or from like your individual morality, which is why Kate, who is very almost cartoonishly evil sometimes, <laughs> is kind of a character of derision is because she, she doesn't really have any choice in what she does because she, they keep talking about something being missing from her. Mm -hmm. There's really nothing there. It's just ugliness. And then N Nick said the characters aren't that nuanced. I think some of them are. I think in, in parts of Lee, I think in parts of um, Caleb. Cal. Cal. Caleb becomes Cal. Yeah, they, Caleb they both Cal. shorten yeah. their names in cool yeah. hip ways. Yeah, Aaron loses an A. I don't <laughs> so yeah, Cal, in him you see this sort of, that duality of man sort of thing, right? Where there's this push and pull between what he wants to be and whether or not he's limited in anything. I mean, it's still somewhat reductive. I mean, it's, reductive. it's very, yeah, it's just very soap opera-ness because he's always just like... I have it in me. I'm going to be evil. And then Lee comes from the other side. He's like, you're not allowed to be. And, you know, it's just, <laughs> you, you're right. I mean. I don't think it's that cheesy, I, but it, yeah. Uh, we can discuss that further. Uh, towards yeah. the end, I felt like, yeah, there was a like, just like, yeah, let's yeah. back, let's like back off of this soap opera thing a little bit. Yeah. The third time it happened, it was enough. Yeah. But like their first conversation I thought was really well done when he goes and sits in Lee's room and it's kind of quiet. Like, uh, that was actually pretty good. Later on, I think it gets a little... Lee's great. And he's kind of... We talked about last Steinbeck, Canterbury Row, the Doc character. I feel like the Doc character re-manifests itself in Lee in this. Where it's the person who's, who's somehow this combination of the common man and also like a philosopher and who's willing to interpret all of this for you and it's coming from a, an unlikely source but somehow it it like basically ties everything together and it's kind of just like through that lens you get to see this essentially and so i, I mean i like that it's kind of after reading a bunch of steinbeck in a row i'm, I'm like wow you, you sort of do that a lot <laughs> but <laughs> But I like it. It's actually one of my favorite parts of the book is like the Lee stuff. I feel like Nathan really likes Lee. Yeah, I was a big fan of Lee. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, I like the book, and I I don't know, like the 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 characters are somewhat archetypal, but I don't I didn't find them to be shallow. I didn't find them to be one dimensional. Maybe with the exception of Kate, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious about you know why he wrote the character that way because I think it was very deliberate as sort of a a foil to everybody else. But I feel like everybody else struggles, and and the struggle is the common denominator. And so you know one one struggles in this way or one struggles in that way. But I sensed a degree of nuance in that. That they weren't just um, stereotypes. I mean, let's take like Adam to start with, right? Arguably like the center character of the whole book. What's his deal? That's my open question. He's just too kind to be anything. He's too lazy to be anything. He's He really is just like a participant in this whole thing. And like, not that... I actually really don't ever think about things in terms of like, I'm frustrated with books because illogical things are happening. I kind of just submit, I'll roll with it. But yeah. this guy is just kind of, you know, like he marries this woman that everybody around knows is like pure evil. And you're like, okay, why did, why did that happen? You know, he, he just kind of, he just kind of moseys from place to place, completely missing the total like obvious stuff that everyone else can see. And I guess there's a purpose to that. And like I said, I don't really get annoyed at this stuff that often. But I was just like, what's the deal? with the, Why do we have somebody like this? What are you trying to say with that character? So if there is nuance, tell me, because I'm, I'm curious what it is. Well, the nuance I think is hard to find in him. I mean, it's not hard to, f it's not impossible, but he's definitely a character that is 
driven by, blinded by, and sabotaged by his naivety. <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of aimless. I mean, he's literally a hobo for for a decent piece of, of the beginning of the book, right? Just kind of wandering around. You see how his his childhood shaped him, and he sort of hated the idea of, of home, but still wanted to have one, right? Which is, I think, a big part of a lot of these characters' motivations is going back to the idea of rejection, right? When something rejects you, you kind of are kind of pushed into wanting it and almost blindly and foolishly into trying and to pursue something that rejects you. So there's that aspect to him. So in the beginning, he just fights against it. He keeps going back to his brother Charles. Again, we have another sibling with A and C as their... their <laughs> Their initials, right? Just making it very um, clear what this is about. Yeah. This is about <laughs> the slow transition from Cain and Abel and kind of seeing how that relationship plays out over time, right? And so, yeah, I think I think that's a big part of it. You see him going back to Charles. They, they, He tries domesticity. They eventually argue. He leaves. He comes back. I feel like the way they described it, I can't imagine him being old enough or young enough to like do all these things because he wanders for years. He's in the <laughs> yeah. war for years. Like what? How old are these people? <laughs> anyway, again, I I have a hard time. Like if a book is trying to be logical and straightforward, it's hard for me to get over those like inconsistencies. I mean, there's kind of a like in the early parts of the Bible, there's like a timeless nature to it. I don't mean timeless in that it stands the test of time, just that it's, I, I think it seems that these people are living for hundreds of years. And it seems well, they are. bizarre. Well, yeah, because yeah. people were stronger back then before we got weakened by technology yeah. and Fords. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> we're trying to, I mean, I honestly, lost. as you were talking, I had this theory that maybe Adam is a stand in for, you know. Adam? No, no, no. But even more so like an ambivalent God, right? Which is basically like he's the one in charge of bestowing basically forgiveness. And he's choosy, right? The quote, like, God is a jealous God, right? He obviously prefers Aaron. And that's the whole tension of that. And that, yeah. you know, he's the one that that forgiveness and that love has to come from. And like, there's always this kind of, I never, I never fully processed it, but like, I didn't understand how in the Bible God could like not be perfect or that he seemed ambivalent or like the whole concept of like creating humans and allowing original sin and allowing them to go do what they want. It's actually kind of one of my beefs with religion in general is like, why didn't you just make that better? <laughs> and that's kind of, I think the emotion that I had with Adam is like, why didn't, why aren't you just better? Why didn't you, why are like, why don't you like show up and be a better father? Why don't you like farm your land? Why don't you do any of this stuff? And so, yeah, kind of, yeah. maybe he's just like the ambivalent God, essentially. I mean, I think th the story is pretty allegorical, um, but I don't know if it's purely allegorical, but I think that the, there's a dominating concept of inheritance and what your responsibility is to that inheritance you know, like Adam's rich because he's, he inherits his father's who he was estranged from and hated wealth. And he believes his father's wealth came from, he believes he stole it from the government basically, but then he can live off of that for the rest of his life and not really have to make any good decisions for, for the rest of his life. And then his sons inherit, well, I guess Aaron, I, I guess it eventually passes on to Cal inherit their mother's wealth who is you know kate the evil character who's who inherited charles wealth i guess right mm -hmm. so and then they don't know what to do with that either and i and you know that they don't actually deal with that in the novel but i think i think that there's and you also inherit your father like you don't get to choose who your father is adam doesn't get to choose cyrus is his father aaron and caleb don't get to choose Adam is their father, you know, these, these deeply flawed human beings. And yet they still have to reconcile their relationship with that figure. They can't just snap their fingers and no longer have that relationship. And who is it who eventually, you know, if we look at Cal and Aaron, who is it who eventually survives this relationship? It's the one who can finally embrace his own darkness. 
Aaron who can't who can't deal with his inheritance. He can't deal with knowing who his mother is. He doesn't kill himself, but he he ends up dying. I think that's a pretty profound idea that that he works out through the course of the novel. And it, it's a bit more subtle than you know when he the quote that I read at the beginning when he's talking about good and evil. It's a bit more subtle than good and evil because we all have good and evil inside of us and what does that mean and how do we what sort of relationship do we have with that yeah and he kind of he outlines that in the chapter that contained that early quote it's a very short chapter it's just kind of like the cornerstone of the book but he talks about uh the deaths of three men and i won't read the whole thing because the first two men one is sort of an evil person when they die as everyone says good we're we're glad that guy's gone And the second one is kind of in the middle, compares to Satan, smart as Satan, he says. And uh, he essentially kind of bribed his way through, but had this veneer of goodness. And so, say, uh, when this man died, the nation rang with praise, and just beneath with gladness that he was dead. And then he says, there was a third man who perhaps made errors in performance, but whose effective life was devoted to making men brave and dignified, and good in a time when they were poor and frightened and when ugly forces were loose in the world to utilize their fears. This man was hated by the few. When he died, the people burst into tears in the streets and their minds wailed. What can we do now? How can we go on without him? I think, yeah, to like Nathan's point, this is about coming to terms with that contradiction and that tension in yourself and accepting that you are going to fail and you are going to be morally flawed and still persevering for like the greater whole, for the the averaged up goodness that you have in you. And I think that, I mean, part of the reasons why I did like a lot of this book is I think that message is really, really powerful now as mm-hmm. we're kind of basically kind of attacking everyone for their smallest flaws. And I think we're missing that message of the whole of like, people can change people can work on things people can evolve and i i think that duality that david mentioned kind of earlier with cal that's like a little bit repetitive over and over i do think that's a super powerful message so i i give props to steinbeck for laying that out there i just it seems to me that like we talk about the characters some of them maybe having nuance some of them not I almost would just rather read Steinbeck's essay on this subject. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's where I landed. It's just like, man, you created this whole world. It's almost like you really just set out that you really wanted to hit 600 pages of a great American novel. And I love long books. That's like my, that's like my (laughs) shtick. But part of me is just like, oh man, you could have just taken your philosophical statements and wrote like a real great, like 50 page full length essay on this. And I would have read the shit out of that. That's where I've arrived. Okay. See, here's the thing. I don't know, man. (laughs) Because in the 600 pages that I read it, I was never not into it. There were moments where I was like, eh, okay, okay. But, like, it reads so easily to me. Like, it's the fastest I've read a 600-page book. read it in, like, I don't know, four days. Yeah, and, I mean, Steinbeck's got – I love his, like, a lot of his prose but to me that aspect was a little bit more missing with this some of his other books have Mm. way cooler prose like this is like you said like nathan said it's kind of a pop novel this is and was incredibly popular to the point where david i mean you had that photo of like the the classic like paperback (laughs) packaging of this book and i love that i like i love like 50s and 60s mass paperbacks where you get that sort of like painted picture on the front and it makes everything seem mm. like you know i don't i keep going back to soap opera but something something like very cheesy but i was like yeah maybe it was in the 60s maybe i'm not sure it was probably after the film was made which i don't know if you guys know they made a film of this yeah Ooh. with james dean have you seen it is, is, is james dean adam no, he's no, he's Cal. Oh, okay, <laughs> but it's only the last piece of the book, right? Yeah, it's only the book four or three and four, maybe kind of mixed together. It's essentially Cal and Aaron's story, mm. and they they change some things. Like in the in the film, Adam is very religious. It's it's much more black and white. If you thought <laughs> this 
book didn't have nuance, then the film... So, it's, it's, somebody it's, read the book and was like, this is great, but it's just too ambiguous. Does their mom <laughs> does their mom still run a whorehouse in the in the film? Yeah. They, yeah. Oh, they could pull that yeah. off? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. Congratulations for getting around the censors, James Dean. Um Yeah, I just yeah. That image or that type of image to me feels fitting to this. I think that's just <laughs> it. Like I I always like books that really resonate with me, I feel like when I read a paragraph or a page whether it's about something or if the, like just the sentences are great and the words are great, if it like leaves an imprint on me, I can kind of feel it. And this, I just felt like I was consuming this story, which oddly enough, I feel like is how the vast majority of people like to read books. And I feel like yeah. I'm like <laughs> the minority here where I'm like, why'd you tell this story so straightforwardly? Why'd you introduce the characters sufficiently? Why'd you do all this stuff that people like, you know? And I think maybe it's because where it's where the book ends and it's kind of where you spend a, the most page time is with Cal and Aaron and Adam. But they're really, there's so much in the beginning of this book that has nothing to do with them at all. And so far, that's kind of all we've really been talking about. Yeah. Like the, uh, the Hamilton family... I, I wanted more of them, honestly. I thought they were very interesting. I just and, wanted to hang out with Samuel. Like, yeah, right? Samuel was so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> he was great. But, like, the story of his of what happened to his family. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's a lot of darkness, too, in this book, like, and sadness. It's It's heavy. Yeah. I mean, basically every Hamilton ended up with some level of tragedy. You know, you have Desi, who ends up being accidentally fed salts, which I guess I didn't understand the science of that. Do you understand how you would die if you had salts? I think she had some... She had something it's, it's going on. It's clear she had like some disease, and then she lied to her brother and said, oh, I just have a stomach ache. Oh, right. And he's like, oh, here, drink this salt concoction, which I think will help you like... And it made it worse? I'm going to file this under our questions about beer milkshakes and the cuisine of Cannery <laughs> Row. This is just the medical version. I'm like, I don't really, yeah. I don't really know. Yeah, it was like when I saw when I saw a young Johnny Steinbeck talking about eating uh, <laughs> oyster loaf. Oh yeah, I'll pass on <laughs> figuring out what that is because that <laughs> sounds disgusting. <laughs> uh, yeah, but cu- cuisine and, and medical uh, solutions aside, yeah, basically the Hamiltons like they all kind of met some level of of tragic ending, right? There was suicide, there was uh, early death. I guess the, I think it's Joe, the youngest one who goes to college because he can't do anything else and ends up being super rich. He becomes in New a York. Man. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that was almost well, even sad in a way too, because they like, they didn't respect him, right? He just kind of got the hell out of Dutch. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, the main sales guy, they don't respect him, even though he's the one that does all of their taxes and keeps all of them on stable financial grounds. Yeah. I think there's something there. Honestly, I kind of feel more drawn to that story. You're right. Like like Samuel coming from Ireland, kind of like you get this impression of heartbreak and he leaves or is pushed out for some reason and he basically takes land that never gives him anything back. And he has all these ideas. He's intelligent. And there's a comment that money is needed to like fight money, essentially. Yeah. I, like I love that stuff about like patent law and everything. So I was like, well, that's that's not not changing either. Still there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like they just they struggled against it all, but it never really took. And I think that's that's almost like the real American story to me. Is like, but that's but that's totally not fair. I mean, Will ends up at the end of the story the richest character, and. Joe, I mean, we don't know anything about Joe, but he's successful in New York City, you know, having moved out from, you know, a dirt floor farm in California. So it's hardly that they all get the shaft. Honestly, I felt like super connected to Will when he was talking about basically his skill set that he had allowed him to make money. Yes. But it's the same exact thing with Cal when they made money and nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted this stuff. They basically didn't respect it at all they deprioritized it they wanted something else they being the family of these respective people and so he's sitting in his office and he's got these things 
and he's helping out his entire family, but he actually just wants to be loved and respected. I think that's even like a line in one of Steinbeck's explanations is that we don't want riches. We want luxury and, and love, I think. Yeah. I think Will makes it out better than some of them, but there's still a, there's an odd loneliness to him. Like he's constantly having to stay busy or seem busy. He's always eating alone. And then when he is eating alone by choice, he <laughs> he, he'll, he invites people to sit down with him at all, the to- at all times. He has this weird, well, not weird because it's a lot of sibling relationships, relationship to his brother Tom. But I, again, it's not like as tragic as Tom's story, which is... Which was fucking brutal. Which is I if thought. you live on a farm and write poetry by yourself, <laughs> you're a weird dude. Yeah, like in my head, that's the dream, you know. <laughs> but uh, but no, it's not for everybody. Yeah, there's all this other shit, and somehow this all just focuses in on Cal and Aaron, which is funny. We really haven't talked about that much. You're right. It just shows that this novel. I don't know. I feel like it could have got at a lot of the same stuff with half the content that's what i keep coming to or re- you could have written two different books i don't know i, I don't know like I, see uh, talking I, about I this i it. like yeah i like it i i like the sort of like environment it's like yeah. here here is a place in time and i mean I, i'm kind of maybe i'm a fan of these like family epics it kind of reminds me of uh 100 years of solitude in that regard it's a different sort of experience to see multiple generations of a family and it's a different sort of character arc because a family has a character arc, just like an individual character does. And I think it's, we don't live that, right? We we live one life and maybe you hear stories about your grandparents, but it's hard to fit yourself into how am I the result of them? How am I the result of their choices? And so I think it's, I think it's interesting to read and it brings to life that his concept, you know, what he's trying to talk about inheritance. It's not just about you. You are, you are the tip of the spear that goes back to the beginning of time. And let's just go back one generation and see how that, you know, influenced Cal and Aaron or, or Will. And none of them can let go of their relationship to their parents. Yeah. I mean, that's character epic is the perfect word for it. So I will, I will give you that. Um, and yeah, I, I think I would much rather always read a, a story about like the deep details and nuance of a very specific thing rather than the sprawling, uh, you know, family and historical background of it all, right? But um, to your point about like the tip of the sphere, I think, yeah, the whole thing is basically the transfer of original sin. It's the transfer of this burden and what you do with that burden, which I think is a fundamental tenet of basically Christianity, which is, to me, I always kind of thought of it as, an, as this weird mechanism and explanation for why there's stuff that's wrong. But if you view it in the individual, I think it does take on a powerful thing, which is none of us are born with these full-on capabilities to do any one specific thing. We're all kind of flawed in some way. We're all different. We all have different burdens. It's impossible for you to compare yourself to anyone else exactly because nobody knows what it's like to be another person. Like you just have yourself. And so I think that like inheritance of the burden, the, the original sin is a reality that we all have to deal with. I think in religious terms, it's, it's like frustrating to me, but in like actual social terms, I think it's, I think it has a lot to unpack. And so, like I said, I, I really identified with like the morality and the, the questions in this book. I think I'm, I'm just maybe not the fan of the form. (laughs) I'm with Nathan. I loved the flow and the movement of the novel actually quite a lot. The way it you sort of just roll with these characters through generations. I almost wish there was just more of of the Hamiltons a little bit. That's all. <laughs> and a little less melodrama in the, the last quarter of the book. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird for such a big book, and maybe it's because... The concept is all laid out by Steinbeck. It feels hard to talk about. That's exactly, yes, yeah. that's exactly how I that, feel. That's the and issue. And that's my point. I like, agree. I don't have a list of shit that I want to like ask questions about. I just already know. Yeah, we already know what these things are. So yeah, I guess maybe we just have to argue about <laughs> the small details. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk. Here, here's, here's a list of topics that I want to hear your opinions on. Kate? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I like let's honestly, it was pretty frustrating. Like like the Kate Kathy character was a pretty fucking rough view of Steinbeck trying to paint a picture of a woman. This was kind of bad. Wait, wait, okay, was, okay. Well that's your take, Nick. I like okay. Like it was almost fucking annoying. Like he's trying to make her so evil that it became silly to me. And I was like, you could have made a better character if you somehow gave her a little bit of the struggle too. But you had to go out of your way <sighs> to fall into this like female trope of like the kind of like the evil woman is manipulating but, stuff. Like it is just but I mean, it's fucking cheesy. But so why did so why did he do that? Well, apparently he wrote this like right after his divorce. <laughs> I think that's uh, the funniest explanation. <laughs> <laughs> See, but I, I think she does have a bit of a struggle in her. Uh, uh, granted, it do, it comes out, you know, in slivers and mostly at the end of the novel. And I think her her suicide is is an act that I it's why did she kill herself? Actually, I was I didn't really understand. I mean, I know that she was in pain, but she was also talking about moving to New York. She kept talking about moving to New York. Well, I think that's where you see like her trying to like a sociopath trying to feel human like okay <laughs> people want to have a nice house and a thing and maybe I'll want that too so because i you never believe it and i think steinbeck does a pretty good job of that cuz even though it's it's pretty clear that she's not going to do that ever i never yeah. it it always felt like this this lie she's just telling herself and you see her get angry when kel recognizes that she knows she's afraid. And so there, there is a fear in her that is sort of pushing her. And she is, don't be wrong, she's still evil and somewhat comically so at times. Whenever she has a drink, the, like, the inner oh, yeah. demon comes out in like 30 seconds. I keep like, yeah. trying to figure yeah. out time. I'm like, wait, <laughs> you just had like seven drinks first off in this scene with four lines of dialogue. And you somehow like became like twice as evil. And you can't control, like, <laughs> the bile spewing out of you. Each time it that's got a, worse. Yeah, I just, yeah, that's, like, my thing. I just it would have benefited from, a, like, a less cheesy character. And <laughs> dare I say that, like, you know, like, if you read a lot of Steinbeck novels, I can't think of, a, of all that great of a female character that he's written. It's basically a couple characters that he puts in motion. Like, you got a doc, you got, like, an outside observer, you got... You know, these things, yeah. but I just, yeah, I felt that, yeah, I felt that the story was kind of weakened by that a little bit in a way. Sorry, Nathan. So, Kate, you do you have a theory about why you think she is this characterization of evil? In defense of Kate by Nathan, go. <laughs> well, I do have my suspicions that he was uh, getting his revenge on his ex-wife for whatever reason. I don't yep. know their backstory, but just <laughs> given the proximity. Like um, what but was I, her name? <laughs> it, was, it was like Catherine. Catherine. I don't yeah. know. I don't know that I have an answer to this uh, because it's very clear that everybody, and he goes to to great lengths early in the book to describe people's internal struggles and how we all share that we struggle internally, except Kate. And he kind of makes it pretty clear that that Kate doesn't have that struggle. And I mean, I don't, I don't have his whole repertoire in my head. Um, to know how he typify, typically treats women characters. But I thought the other women characters in the book, though not primary characters, had their subtleties from, you know, Mrs. Hamilton to Abra to Faye. They certainly weren't weren't evil characters. They had, you know, personalities. So to me, Kate is really the foil. Everybody's struggling and essentially good. And I think that seems to be Steinbeck's general philosophy, that people are essentially good and they do bad things because because their father didn't love them or whatever. And they're trying to make up for that, except Kate. And so Kate becomes kind of the foil, the pure evil that everybody has to respond to. And I, I think, I think in that way, uh, I'm, I'm watching, rewatching Lord of the Rings right now. And I actually think there's kind of some parallels between Lord of the Rings and this, <laughs> but in fantasy stories, you have absolute evil and we don't, we don't question whether or not it's, you know, misogynist that Sauron is evil. It's just part of the story. Sauron is evil. So the characters have to respond to evil. And we don't think of people that way anymore, generally. 
We don't think somebody is evil because they robbed a store or whatever. But it's really hard to look at, for instance, the Golden Gate Killer and not think that that guy is missing something. He lacks something. And that maybe is what evil is. And evil does actually exist. It's just a rarity. Yeah. I mean, there's that, there's a good paragraph on that in the book about like the nature of monsters. If we can see, if we can see monsters with physical markings, quote unquote, um, yeah, that why can't there be, weird. why can't there be, yeah, mental markings of monsters and evil? And yeah, I, I actually really like your lens of fantasy because that's what we were talking about before with Steinbeck stuff is he oddly was this sort of fantasy author. He was telling this fantasy story of America, specifically like Central Valley, California in this book. And so that makes sense to me. I'll I'll buy that. I'll buy that usage of, of Kate and Kathy, even though his first wife's name was named Carol. I checked it. <laughs> Not close enough. But he also was married multiple times, like most prominent dude authors in the middle of the century, I guess. The quote, to a man born without conscience, a soul-stricken man must seem ridiculous. To a criminal, honesty is foolish. You must not forget that a monster is only a variation, and that to a monster, the norm is monstrous. And then, it actually, this is him right before he's talking about Kathy. It is my belief that Kathy Ames was born with the tendencies, or lack of them, which drove and forced her all her life. Some balance wheel was misweighted, some gear out of ratio. She was not like other people, never was from birth. So, I mean, she is essentially born evil. And there's that constant refrain throughout of something's missing from that lady, right? Yeah. She even had, like, pointed teeth, right? Oh, they were just, I thought they were just sharp and small. <laughs> they were definitely small. Oh, she destroyed Samuel's hand, right? Oh, shit, that's right. <laughs> so on no, on number two of Nathan's list is Tim Shell. Yeah, this came up in book club when we talked about the halfway section. So I went out and did a little more research on it. The Hebrew word is not. It's not exactly the it's, Hebrew word. It's right? not Tim Shell. It's Tim Shoal. I think is how it's typically spelled, and it it doesn't exactly mean thou mayest. But I think I don't know. I don't know if either of you look deeper into this. Nope, you're the expert here. All right, well, I'll share this and then we can discuss. Um, obviously, I'm no expert. I don't read Hebrew. And it sounds very complicated. Like the 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 way that the word is structured can mean multiple different things in different contexts. But um, my understanding is what it, what it actually means closer is something like must master. But the concept of mastery, this is where it gets specific and where I think it's interesting. And I, I was just reading a forum where people were discussing what this means, and it was they seemed to speak Hebrew, so I thought this sounded like they knew what they were talking about, but this is just off the internet. I'm no scholar. That the, the word really means to master something like to control from within. So not to vanquish. Like self-mastery. Something like self-mastery, yeah. Mm. But you are always, you are a part of this system, and you, you want to be the ruler of the system, not to be ruled by that system. Um, so it's like establishing a relationship to it, um, which I think is still a pretty interesting concept. And I, I if, you, if you Google this, uh, a lot of people are bashing Steinbeck about totally misunderstanding the Hebrew. And I, I don't think he does, actually. I think he makes it mm -hmm. more clear than the, the ambivalence actually is, I, I think. But but the, the concept of agency, I think I think is still there. And that's that's the mm -hmm. important part. I think that goes to a lot of what we've kind of been talking about is I think what Steinbeck does in this book is really simplify things almost too much at points, at least for, for us to be able to have a, a somewhat engaging conversation yeah. <laughs> with it. Maybe if we disagreed with the, the fundamental philosophy, this would be more interesting. Yeah. And honestly, I bet that, I bet that podcast episode exists. Oh, I'm sure. Right? I'm sure there's people it that. Very, it was very uh, out of fashion to have any... Um, I don't know, resonance with that. Oh, Although, yeah. like I said, I think it's I think it's too simplified. I, I almost while while I find some connection with it, it almost seemed at times that this was like his last stand that he was trying to put out there. <laughs> we will all be individuals. You are in charge. See, you know. I don't think it's that political. I think it's more literally about the choices you make 
about how you behave in situations and how you act. I mean, the quote that I had read earlier was very specifically about like politics yes. stuff, yeah. for sure. But yeah, I agree. But I, you can't differentiate personal choice from politics because because that is the argument. Yeah. The argument is, is everything political or do you have agency? Right. So he's showing this, he's showing these individual people and how they have to deal with their choices in order to make the point that, hey, let me show you an example of some people who had questionable inheritances, um, who had, who weren't perfect people and what they did with that. And by the way, this is how everything is. There's only one story. We're all born with it. We all have good and evil within us. And it's our own responsibility to place good over evil in every moment and every decision throughout our lives. Yeah. And to Steinbeck, the only way you can do that is if you believe and fortify the idea that the individual is the most important thing, the strongest thing. He talks about it. I think maybe, Nick, you almost read it, or maybe we read it, where he talks about that he would fight. It was like the one thing he would fight for early mm-hmm. on. Let me see if I can yeah, find that. that was the. I think that was the quote I read. Yeah, right? Okay. If not, it's because that similar quote exists a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's, you know, like I said, it's it's hard to it's hard to take this as a simplified pure statement to me because I think it's always murkier that in real life. Yeah. But I do appreciate it, but I also don't think it's as just as streamlined as that. Just in the same way I don't think like the collective is as streamlined as a lot of people argue. I think it's the tension. And that's almost why I kind of identify a little bit more with some of the earlier Steinbeck works where I think he was talking about that tension more. This Mm. time I feel like he kind of has shifted over his career and his own personal progression to be more of like individuals first only. And I think I I like the push-pull that he was working with earlier in his career. But he does that here, it's just... It's it's very focused on family relations, the family unit, that fight for individual and individual freedom is within that sort of space. And like what Nathan talked about, whether or not we are burdened by what we inherit from our parents. And then it's also about the relation. A big thing is sibling relationships as well. So I think it's not so much about like community as in society. I mean, it's there a little bit, but it's really focused on the family relationship more than anything. I, there's one spot, and I want to read this quote, where he kind of ties this back into being American, which I thought was kind of interesting. Is this Lee's quote? Yeah. I thought that was great. When- yeah. Yeah. Lee's um, talking to Cal. He says, we all have that heritage, no matter what old land our fathers left. All colors and blends of Americans have somewhat the same tendencies. It's a breed selected out by accident. So we're over brave and over fearful. We're kind and cruel as children. We're over-friendly and at the same time frightened of strangers. We boast and are impressed. We're over-sentimental and realistic. We are mundane and materialistic. And do you know of any other nation that acts for ideals? We eat too much. We have no taste, no sense of proportion. We throw our energy about like waste. In the old lands, they say of us that we go from barbarism to decadence without an intervening culture. Can it be that our critics have not the key or the language of our culture? I think that I think in some regard that's we have an American inheritance, and I think he's also kind of dealing with that. And I don't know in the fifties what that dialogue looked like about what we've inherited as Americans, what, what we what our forefathers have taken from this land and, and left us with. But in in a regard, I, th- I think maybe that's what he's talking about when like Cyrus, the grandfather of the family, had stolen this money. Kate had prost- had run this brothel. And that that's the inheritance and that you, you have it. Now, what do you do with it? And in some regard, those are our parents as Americans, because certainly whether you are a direct lineage or not as Americans, some evil has been done in the past. Yeah. Original sin part four. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. It's like that. That is, that is it. That is it. Since the beginning of time, you, you were born with a burden, you know, and this, I, I tie this back to Lord of the Rings, you know, Frodo inherits this ring from Bilbo. He didn't ask for it. And yet he has to carry that burden and decide what he's going to do with it. You know, because 
Abel didn't survive, right? The good son didn't survive. We're all descendants of Cain. Cain, 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 Thanks for listening. As always, you can find us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Twitter and Instagram with the handle Books O Substance. Happy Gilmore. It's, it's kind of funny. I watched it a couple of years ago. It's not bad. It's got uh, got some of that classic Steinbeck. Thou mayest control yourself and become a good go- Holy shit, it's the same. <laughs> <laughs>